Good evening and welcome to another Linux Saloon. This is a place to talk tech, open source, and Linux. I'm sorry. And where Linux is always on tap. So each show will have a talk about a Linux project. Generally, it'll be a distribution, but it could be centered on any desktop environment or application. Anything that is Linux and open source is on the table for discussion. So how is everyone? Doing great. Doing good. Awesome. Doing so good. Excellent. I'm really happy to hear that. I'm glad we have Shickle here because we're going to, uh, I would say, pick his brain. We're probably going to you know, smack his brain around on Pop! OS, and he's going to be our, our, um, our expert on the panel who's also kind of an insider. So I don't know if this is like well, insider I trading. Well, I do have it installed on three different <clears throat> situations. Yeah, you don't count, Steve. You don't count. I'm kidding. I'm kidding, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Vince isn't even here. God. I was my I was I was uh, conjuring up my inner Vince, uh, my inner to, uh, to to basically let you have it. All right, so we're gonna be talking about coming up. We're gonna talk about the uh, distro exploration of Pop OS. We're gonna check the menu on uh, what's on the next distro cocktail. We'll go over a news flight, uh, community free pour, and then we'll finish off with a last call. But first, uh, we talk about what we've been doing in Linux. So this last week, I have been setting up and building a uh, server, rack, network, whatever uh, station in my basement. So I've my network area has been basically a disaster for um, since I moved. I kind of basically like threw it together, slapped stuff together to kind of get, you know, just so I could have some everything operational. And then I says, well, I'll get to it later when I have time to, you know, refine things. And I, uh, a few weeks back, I went on vacation. And so my, uh, I had someone, there, I mean, I had someone watching the house and somebody did something and shut off the power to to the server so they lost internet and everything and they lost access to my home assistant my remote stuff anyway so i had someone come over and turn it back on but they were a little bit uh, how should we say uncomfortable about the mess of wires and spaghetti rats nest that it was you know like a couple of uh uh, there's uh, power strips, you know, plugged into each other into the back of the UPS and, and all this stuff. So I decided it was time to just clean it all up, put in a proper server rack and, and like clean up all the wires and everything. Now I'm, I'm not a sysadmin. I don't do any, I'm not a network guy. I don't do any of those things. So it's not really, it's, it's not my, it's not my area of expertise at all. So anyway, I, I, I bought uh, a two post rack because I figured that's good enough. And it is. And I, over the last uh, a couple of weeks, you know, I've been getting parts in, put in some shells and add things and move stuff around. And I got, I got like a, I spent way too much on a drawer, a 19 inch wide drawer that fits in there, a 4U high drawer. I don't want to say how much I spent on that because I'm embarrassed. But um, so about $450 later, I have a very nice network center in my house. So I'm very happy about it. It looks good. It's clean. Uh, you're not going to have, you're not going to trip on any wires anymore. And so I am, I'm very excited about that. Yay. Good for you. So now the question is, do I take my server, which is basically just a giant PC case, and put it in a proper rack mount and spend another 100 bucks, Or do I just leave it as it is and kind of walk away and smile? Well, if it's working and, uh, and it's aesthetically pleasing to you and you don't mind it, then leave it the way it is. Why mess with something that's working? That's I'm a good point. going to be weirdo and say, if there's enough space in the bottom of your rack, just take the server and put it in the bottom of the rack at the very bottom. Oh, it's not... there. It's on a shelf. Yeah. It's on a yeah. shelf in there. Just leave, so it just, there. just leave it there next to the UPS. Yeah. Now, I, I do yeah. know that I have exceeded the weight capacity of of that shelf by a few pounds. So it, it is a little, it's not, I'm not going to say it's precarious, but it's a bit precarious. <laughs> hmm. Well, I've always subscribed to the the if it if it's not broken fix it until it is. Oh, okay. Motto. <laughs> I, I like, I like that, that one a lot. Yeah, that that that's actually that's the motto. Surprisingly, <laughs> I do too. Sometimes I'm like, it's fun. It's like it's like it works, but it might be better if. And then sometimes it turns into a 12 hour fix after I've tried to fix it and make it better and really actually just made it worse. Thankfully, if it's a Linux problem, I can just you know snap or roll back and I'm okay. But sometimes there's no snapper roll back in real life, so there there is that. So, if anybody else anything else they want to share about uh, their week in Linux or their uh, in week in tech or anything anything exciting? Yes, Shickle. Uh, oh wait, no. Let Pete let Peter okay. go because I like okay, Peter go. No, I, no pressure. No, I'm just laughing. You put your hand up so fast. <laughs> <laughs> 
So I have been doing a lot of fiddling. I may have been distro hopping. I, I know I know I wouldn't do that normally, mm -hmm. right? That's not a thing, but no, no, I never. did it. No. <laughs> um, and I have tried a lot of things, um, but recently I've been playing around with, um, with disk encryption and I have managed to, <laughs> I have managed to sort of find a way to like reuse encryption. I didn't actually know you could like reuse an encrypted volume to like install other operating systems. So I have like installed OpenSUSE, Ubuntu and Arch on all on like one encrypted partition. Um, I It hasn't broken yet, <laughs> but I'm having a lot of fun doing it. So I'm, I'm gonna try and write something up about it because it's kind of fun. <laughs> Oh, you're muted. I'm curious to know why my, uh, I can never remember <laughs> that I'm muted. Um, <laughs> when you encrypt something, let's, let's play, because I, I don't, shame on me, I don't encrypt my drives because it's just another method, another avenue for me to screw something up and lose my data. That's, I'm more concerned about losing my data and never being able to access again because I, I don't know what I'm doing. So what yes. I do is I, I use the plasma vaults for, mm. for, for the data that I'm, I, I'm concerned about. Yes. Because I can move that from, from disk to disk and I don't have to worry about, you know, whatever, you know, is in that vault is encrypted. So yeah. instead of doing a whole disk encryption, I just do like, these are my files that I want to make sure are, you know, harder to access, but the rest of stuff, you know, yeah. like, like the, I don't really care about. Now, my question is, let's say you start with pop OS and, and you encrypted the drive, your, let's say your home directory or something. I don't know. And then you move to OpenSUSE and you mm. want to carry that encrypted drive over. What would be the process to decrypt that drive mm. and use it with a different distribution? Well, um, OpenSUSE is really awesome in this regard. And I'm not just saying that because I know you like OpenSUSE. Well, <laughs> but... um, I mean, it, <laughs> what you're saying sounds really cool to me right now. So it doesn't... Uh... Yast is really good about sort of like managing partitions, even especially like BTRFS sub volumes and all that stuff. So um, when you start the installer and there's an encrypted install there, and a, a few other installers also do this, um, OpenSUSE will just basically be like, hey, this is encrypted. Do you want to decrypt it? And it'll just ask you to put in the decryption key. And then from there, you can go to the guided set or the, the expert setup, the the custom one but you can mm -hmm. start with existing partitions okay and once you go into that screen it'll like show you all your volumes and the unlocked encrypted disk will be in there so you could do whatever you want with it at that point really yeah so it's pretty cool so the inc whatever encryption scheme pop uses or let's just say any distribution that encrypts the drives open susa or possibly other distributions know the drive requires something to unlock the drive so far it's worked yeah it's okay. like it, it's it like looks for uh encrypted drives before it like presents it it's, it's pretty cool that's really interesting I, I feel like i should play with that i've just been um all right so i, I realize it's been like 12 years since i last tried encrypting a drive and it failed miserably oh, wow. for me so uh i've just i've had like that uh that fear of going in the deep end again i guess is my my thing so i just the the only reason that I really do it, like on my home machines, I don't, but because my laptop I take out, mm -hmm. I'm not really worried about like somebody specifically targeting me, but I figure that if somebody does happen to grab my laptop, like, you know, I can't really like put my browser in a plasma vault. So like any right. of like the sites that I'm signed into, I don't want somebody being able to, you know, tweet as me on Twitter or look at my bank information or anything like that. So that's my main concern is that like, if somebody does happen to, to swipe my laptop and they managed to get past the, the login screen because those aren't really too difficult to get past. I mean, they're, they're decent, but if you have physical access to a device, all bets are off, you know? <laughs> right. That, that makes sense. Maybe I need to, I need to really need to play with that again. My, my thing is like, if someone, if someone takes my laptop f from my hands, it's probably going to be my cold dead hands. And at that point, I really, I don't think I'd care. That's fair. Yeah. <laughs> So maybe it won't be cold, quite, quite cold, but that just like anyway. lukewarm. Yeah. <laughs> Boy, so, what did I come back to talking about people taking stuff out of their dead hands? Yeah. I'm just saying if somebody, <laughs> they're going to have to really work hard to take it from me, I guess is what I'm saying. 
Um, although I, I suppose, you know, there's the possibility, however extremely, extremely remote, you're traveling internationally or whatever, and they, you know, there's, there's some, I guess, some countries that, that will, um, could pry into your things by traveling. I don't travel much anymore uh, at all. So it's, if I do travel, I'd, maybe I'd take something, not my main laptop, I guess. So that's good. Something to look into. Encryption. Hold disk encryption, I guess. I do I have, have some something. bad news about Linux. Oh, do share. Right. So uh, there's a little thing going on in China right now called the Olympics. And a lot of people are trying to watch it. And I had a few friends who use Linux uh, also try to access Peacock, uh, the NBC channel. And, uh, and Peacock is not allowing Linux browsers to uh, access their streams. Hmm. It's like the it's like the problem HBO Max had at the start, which got fixed. But Peacock is not working on Linux browsers. However, I did test in my Chromebook, and it worked on the Chromebook fine. Interesting. Did you try Chrome on Linux to see if that would access? Peacock? I did. I tried Firefox and I tried Chrome. There's a whole bunch of us testing and taking coffee and to help some someone. They eventually uh, got access via YouTube TV. Hmm. That's interesting. I wonder why that is. E G. Some, Sorry. Some some level of encryption or whatever, some different thing that's not supported. A DRM in. or something. Jason yeah. seemed to perk up when I mentioned it. So. We well, got excited about the cat. Yeah. yeah I, no, I heard about the whole the whole sh Linux that that issue with the the, the uh, what do you call that the Olympics and stuff. I saw it on a um, some Linux uh, discussion somewhere, and uh, yeah, it's I have no no nobody knows exactly what's going on from what I've read, but it's you know it's got to be something to do with the way they they're um reading the you know the, the something to do with the transmission i guess it's supposed to speak you know they're blocking that you know the version of chrome or or browsers in general from that uh, from linux and maybe there's some sort of like extension that it reads or something when it, when it's transmitting the data and they're just like nope we don't want that and i don't understand why it's you know it's yeah. but it's you know they probably didn't encode it properly and, and you know when they were setting everything up you know kind of like hbo HBO did, you know, when they had a little snafu there when they did it as well. So it's probably just something in the way they set it up. Disney Plus for a while, I couldn't access on Linux. I think it was cleared. I up. think it was the the DRM was set too high, I think, and it wasn't Linux compatible. And I think they lowered it afterwards. Yeah, I didn't. Well, they must have lowered it before, you know, um, or after I was already using it. I don't know. Yeah. I, I was, I've used Disney Plus on Linux on the on Mint and in Manjaro, and I never had any problems with it. Yeah, I've never had a problem with Disney, Disney Plus. It was HBO Max that had the problem. I didn't test HBO Max. I didn't, you know, obviously Netflix and Amazon Prime and um, the other one there, Disney. I haven't, I haven't had any problems. That's what I meant. Sorry, it was HBO Max. HBO Max, when they launched, it was, it was the DRM was too high, I think. Hmm. Yeah. I made it funny that Chrome OS is like Schrodinger's cat. It's, it's Linux, but it's also not Linux. <laughs> So is it dead in the box? Or alive, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or just yes to both. Yeah. Well, I'm going to welcome Donnie. I haven't heard his mic crack yet. So I'm make sure that his... <laughs> so that, I just want to make sure his... his volume... Okay, your volume's good. That's good. I just, that was my way of, uh, of very slyly checking, doing your mic levels without people knowing that are watching. That's, that's what that was for. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> All right. That's, that's why I'm not a professional. Okay. <laughs> I think it was, we're going to roll into uh, Pop OS. I don't know, Steve, if you want to take it away. Okay. So our distro explanation today is Pop OS, uh, but we're going to talk about some rules first. So the intent is to talk about the different aspects of the OS and discuss the experience after using it. This discussion that by which only objective and constructive uh, constructive criticism will be a product. Uh, Non-objective opinions like this is garbage uh, is that helpful. Rather, if you say, I wish I had this feature or I really need features that allow me to, you will benefit the conversation. Uh, the point to remember, the point is to highlight the positive, but not ignore the lowlights of the project as well. Remember, this is a labor of love for some. Uh, let's not poo-poo it. And uh, let's be respectful of each other and give each other a chance to talk. So so we had a, uh, a telegram, uh, straw Paul. And it was uh, about the weekly aspiration, what's popping. And 19% said Pop OS is amazing, 
38, 38% said Papo S is okay. 4% said I am not having a good time with Papo S. 8% said I'm not interested in trying Papo S. 15% said I don't have time for this exploration. 8% said I'm not in interested in doing the explorations in general. And 8% said other, please reply, uh, other give details. The only reply that I got uh, that I remember was I loved it until after I, I set it up shortly after the super key search feature goes dead, either by the key or by the icon. Both don't work. I reinstalled three times trying to find out where it goes awry, but I couldn't figure it out. But it, 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 will always, it always went dead. And that was an other vote. So my adventure with Pop right now is that I installed it. I'm enjoying it, but for some reason it refuses to see my sound card. So I can't use my microphone. So oh, I'm on a phone wow. and I'm not going to do that reading <laughs> over my okay. phone. So sorry. No worries. It's okay. actually, you sound pretty good. So, but it's, but I understand it's probably uh, inconvenient and difficult to manage the phone and the reading. So I got it. All right. So I, go ahead, Steve, if you want to take it away, feel free. Okay. I, we can switch it off. Uh, so about Pop OS, uh, Pop OS is a free and open source Linux distribution based on Ubuntu and featuring a GTK desktop environment known as Cosmic, which is based on GNOME. The distribution is developed by American Linux computer manufacturer System76. Pop! OS is primarily built to be bundled with the computers built by System76, but can also be downloaded and installed on most computers. Uh, Pop! OS provides full out-of-the-box support for both AMD and NVIDIA GPUs. It is regarded as an easy distribution to set up for gaming, mainly due to its built-in GPU support. Uh, Pop! OS uh, provides disk, uh, default disk encryption, uh, streamlined window and workspace management, keyboard shortcuts for navigation, as well as built-in power management profiles. The latest releases also have packages that allow for easy setup for TensorFlow and CUDA. Pop! OS is maintained primarily by System76 with the release version code uh, hosted in a GitHub repository. Unlike many other Linux distributions, it is not a community-driven, although outside programmers can contribute, view, and modify the source code. They can also build custom ISO images and redistribute them under another name. So the features, Pop! OS primarily uses free software with some priority, pri proprietary software used for hardware drivers and for Wi-Fi, discrete GPU, and media codecs. It comes with a wide range of default software, including LibreOffice, Firefox, and Geary. Additional software can be downloaded using the package manager, the Pop Shop. Uh, Pop! OS uses APT as its packet manager and initially did not use Snaps or Flatpak, but Flatpak support was added in version 2004 LTS. Software packages are available from the Ubuntu repositories as well as Pop! OS's own repositories. Pop! OS uh, features a customized GNOME shell interface with a Pop! OS theme. There is a GUI toggle in the GNOME system menu for switching between different video modes on dual GPU laptops. There are three display modes, hybrid, discrete, and iGPU only. There is a power management package developed from the in Intel Clear Linux distribution. And Pop! OS uses Xorg as its display manager with Wayland available optionally, as Ubuntu has done. Uh, Wayland lacks support for proprietary device drivers, in particular NVIDIA, while XORG is supported. To ensure use of NVIDIA proprietary drivers for most performances in GPU switching, Pop! OS uses only XORG to date. TensorFlow and CUDA-enabled programs can be added by installing packages from the Pop! OS repositories without additional configuration required. It provides a recovery partition that can be used to refresh the system while preserving user files, it can be used only if set up during initial installation. Uh, from the 2104 release, Pop! OS included a new GNOME-based desktop environment called COSMIC, an acronym for Computer Operating System Main Interface Components, developed by System76. It features separate views for workspaces and applications, a dock included by default, and supports both mouse-driven and keyboard-driven workflows. System76 started stated it will be creating a new desktop environment not based on GNOME. This desktop environment will be written in Rust and developed to be similar to the Cosmic desktop used since version 2104. System76 cites limitations with GNOME extensions as well as a disagreement with GNOME developers on the desktop experience as reasons to build a new desktop environment.
Uh, the ISO options are, uh, you can download the 2110 now. Uh, there's the NVIDIA uh, driver, the, uh, straight up is AMD. Uh, they have one set up strictly for NVIDIA and they have a Raspberry Pi now. Which is awesome. I think I love it when I see uh, immediate support for the Raspberry Pi. It's such a fun computer to mess with. I don't know, does anybody here have Raspberry Pi besides me? Okay, Shiko, of course. Not. Jinda. Mm -hmm. Steve, you got to get yourself a Raspberry Pi. Eris, I think he's raising his hand saying he has a Raspberry Pi or maybe a comment, whichever. No, I have, I have a Pi. I have, okay. I have, a, I have two ad guards. Oh, up. nice. This is, this, this is my, uh, my, my play around with uh, Pi 4. So it's great. You got for, a Pi 400. Yes, that's oh. also a fun one. Yeah. That, so I'm part of that club too. Let's see. All right. <laughs> but I have a, a Pi Mega on this one right now Ooh. look at another pie i think it's, you got the flirt case too there jason yeah it looks like it's the flirt this looks... is the one that comes with the, the canna kit okay um so it's just basically the same same thing exact thing as what you have it just says canna kit on it okay yeah i got nothing on the top of mine so as we, i mean as... if you look at the front same thing uh oh all right so um i guess let's move on to the installation process obviously it's different if you install for a raspberry pi than for uh, x86 so whatever you installed it on i didn't do the raspberry pi ran out of time for the week but i'd like to know what uh how your installation process went uh i know eric if you want to chime in on that now um obviously you're having some you're having great time with it so i know that much yeah yeah the installation was was actually not bad i had to do a custom just because I wanted to keep my dual boot. Um, it does not do like OS Prober and do a grub, uh, custom grub to be able to choose which system to boot at boot time. Uh, so you'd have to switch using the EFI manager uh, between the bootloaders. But um, I'm also just now getting a message about the EFI partition being almost full. So I'm not sure what it did. I need to go in and, and look at that. So again, I. I brought that up last week thinking maybe that was going to be a problem, and it does seem as though Pop wants to be the only OS on the disk, from what I can tell, at least so far, at least the way I have it set up. So, um, yeah. But otherwise, the installer is very nice. It's very clean. It's very, you know, professional. Um, yeah. I have a question for you. So I do notice that Pop OS doesn't have secure boot as an option. You have to disable secure boot, at least according to the directions. Is that, a, is that an issue for you and, and how you use your machines? No, because I always have secure boot off anyway. Okay, all right. Does anybody else have an issue with secure boot, like they, they run secure boot on their machines? No. Or, okay, am I, am I the cheese that stands alone on that one? Since... None of my systems have secure boot. Okay, well, I guess uh, I do use secure boot, and I have now for five-ish or so years. Um, so I don't know. I guess I'm the weird one. All right. Um, anybody else? Any comments on the installation process and how, how you felt about that? Peter. Ahead, Peter. Right. So my system is somewhat unique uh, to the way I have it set up. Uh, I have a, a 11 year old laptop, so it's very legacy. When you talk about uh, secure boot and uh, and the modern way of booting, and uh, it doesn't recognize that. It's very legacy. It's very grub. So it's 11 years old. And I have my I have three tests and partitions on an external drive connected by an eSTATA link. And the good thing with the installer was I could say to the installer, go install Pop OS on the third partition of the external drive. And it did it. It did install it. However, it did not update the grub menu on my SDA. Because when I rebooted it was still showing as the previous uh, distro I had in a partition. I, all I did was on uh, PC Linux OS, my main system on the, on the laptop, I run Grab Customizer, and that fixed everything. And then when I rebooted again, uh, Pop OS was there on the third partition on the external drive, and it opened up fine. So that, that was my way around it. So I was going to say, uh... Vince said in the comments that secure boot requires a certificate from Microsoft. So you'll probably only see support for it from the large distros. Okay. And I don't know SUSE, so that's probably why. And I think Donnie wanted to say something. So go ahead, Donnie. Yeah. So I was the opposite of Eric. I was actually 
uh, use the install pop OS. Uh, uh, up, uh, updated the file for the uh, uh, the boot menu to be displayed within five minutes. And I found an easy tutorial online to actually copy uh, the file for Windows because I have to use Windows on my computer for work. So and I was able to get Windows displayed on the boot menu. So that was that worked out pretty good. Installation was very easy. Uh, it's Pop OS, so their installation is good. I just wish they have the option for ButterFS, but it's still good. Uh, I don't mind using the XT4, but other than that, it was great. Yeah, right. and I can say I, I installed it. I, I've, I've got it on three different, well, I have it on two on one machine on my desktop. I have uh, uh, what I set up for the family. And then, because I have an IC dock, I also have set up a pop uh, OS for my stream setup. So like uh, nothing, like if something happens to the family computer, it nothing will mess up with it. And then I have it on my main laptop. Uh, the only thing that you have to kind of be careful is uh, if you have an NVIDIA driver or, or, or an NVIDIA card that you make sure that you do use the NVIDIA download because I made a mistake because uh, I, I downloaded both of them. One, because my laptop doesn't have NVIDIA and I had burned a USB with the regular AMD and it stopped in the middle of the process. Um, you wouldn't think it would, that it would just maybe install a generic driver, but it's, it is, seems to be very specific to NVIDIA or um, non-NVIDIA. Hmm. So just watch out for that. Otherwise, you know, three instances, I think I, I did have an error uh, on uh, my IC doc uh, one, um, but it was easy fix. Uh, and one of the great things about pop that I found out is also the, uh, the uh, a rollback option and the uh, recovery option. That is, it, it, it did help uh, on an issue that I had. Well, the reason I, I brought up about the um, secure boot is I wonder if like for people who dual boot, like if they still do boot into windows, if that's a problem, if you don't have. Um, I I have a number of Drugger OS users. Drugger OS does not support Secure Boot, and they dual boot. Um, it doesn't seem like it's an issue at all. Okay. Um, and I've installed Windows and virtual machines before that don't support Secure Secure Boot. Doesn't seem to be an issue. Um, Windows 11 will probably complain like crazy, but Windows 10 probably doesn't care. Yeah, I'm, I'm using Windows on this computer and Pop OS and does not complain at all yes yeah, so. I, I will say though um if you are using bitlocker drive encryption you have to your use secure boot if you have that going and then you disable secure boot your computer will not boot period because when the windows nt kernel boots it will check that and when it sees that you're also using uh bitlocker it just will refuse to boot hmm. it'll throw an error at you um there's a something else where like there's some other issues where like you just you do not want to disable secure boot unless until you disable bitlocker first in um, regards to secure boot complaining by the way that generally shouldn't matter with other operating systems installed it's to help prevent modifications of the bootloader for that system so secure boot essentially um will prevent things from like it's why like if you turn secure boot on after you've already installed, you may not be able to boot into that system because the keys don't match what the operating system has. So it's it's basically a signing process in a way, hmm. but it, it won't matter for other operating systems because they don't interact with each other. So kind of like booting my lineage OS on a, uh, on a cell phone or an Android device, how they, it kind of barks at you when you first started up. Yeah, just okay. about. Mark, you had something you want to say. Yeah, so, you know, I uh, typically install in either uh, Vulture or DigitalOcean mm -hmm. uh, for my test uh, scenarios. And this time I installed in Vulture and the um, I initially tried the, the first download, uh, which was the uh, AMD Intel. That didn't work with their hypervisor for some, for some reason. It just... Ran into issues. I couldn't even boot the live distribution, but I did go and use the uh, AMD uh, 
uh, NVIDIA, and -hmm. that worked just fine. And so uh, went through the installation fine um, and, uh, you know, didn't have issues. That's good. I like that you test the distributions in a different way that everybody else does because you give a unique perspective every time and how it works, yeah. you know, in your, in your, uh, vir- your virtual machine craziness that yeah, is out yeah. there. And I, I really appreciate that. My, and I, and I hope my can... cloud, my cloudy desktop. Yes. Your cloudy desktop. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I also installed it locally, uh, on a, on a second drive on a, mm-hmm. on a old PC and it worked fine there too. Okay. How was the performance on that? Well, actually, we'll get to that later. So, um, anybody else want to talk about on the uh, the installation process? Yeah, I almost got off track. Steve, you can yell at me later for that. Anything? Any other comments? Oh, Ginger, do you have something you want to say? You look like you want to to you get the smile on your face that tells me you know. I had no issues installing it whatsoever. I went smooth and silk, and it was perfect. Excellent. I like hearing that. That's great. Rick. Same for me. Yep, you did a live stream install, and I know that also Colin, he, he did a, well, actually made a short out of his install process, or part of it anyway, so that was cool. Yeah. Um, I also right. installed a hard drive up here on my testing computer, and went fine. Excellent. Fed up and running right now. Cool. Is that uh, what you're streaming off of right now, or, or, or conferencing off of I'm it? I'm not streaming off of it, it's, but I could stream off if I wanted to, I okay. suppose. Well, you don't have to switch. We don't, we don't make any craziness for, for that. <laughs> All right. Well, excellent. Now, as far as the default application selection. Oh, Steve, I just jumped on you. That's uh, okay. Yep. Go ahead. Used to it. Um, what did everybody think yep. about the default applications? I mean, uh, they have their pop shop, which is uh, they were working with. I think they got it from elementary. Uh, I find it uh, a, a very nice setup. It certainly looks much better than like the Ubuntu store. Uh, and I think it actually looks a little bit better than an elementary store. Uh, and uh, the fact that, uh, you know, it has the dev packages and uh, the, um, the uh, flat packs, if, they, if there is a flat pack for it, for the uh, applications. Did anybody test out some of the applications? I mean, I'm a, a, a almost a year user now on Pop. So I, I really like the pop shop. Anybody else? I think, uh, well, I was just, I've done a fresh install because I've been running Pop! OS for 16 months, I think. And so I thought I'd, I'd give it a, a fresh install. So they don't, they give you LibreOffice out of the box um, and a web browser, Geary uh, Mail, and not too much other stuff. I think it's left for the user to decide what they want to install. Um, but it's there's enough there just to get you going. Um, so that's pretty cool. And, and yes, the pop shop is quite good. And I think they have, correct me if I'm wrong, I think they have flat packs set up out of the box. Because yeah. I've done a fresh install, I look for some uh, applications and all the flat packs came up, which is fantastic for new users because all this nonsense that you got to go through to go to the flat, flat hub, quick setup, couple of commands in the terminal we need to get away from that and i think pop's done a great job of introducing that and they introduce a lot of applications for new users um where they can just find it in one central location and i think that's great mm-hmm. yeah i i totally agree here's something that i really like about the pop shop not to not to jump on anybody here but if you if you look at the pop shop they they have like the way they lay it out is very nice. It's very welcoming. It's not, you know, it's not cluttered. And then I like how they have like the, their pop picks mm-hmm. on one side and then some very common applications that you would likely see for, especially, I know pop, correct me if I'm wrong, Shickle, but pop OS kind of targets the maker, the uh, developer world a yeah. little bit more. Like that's, that's, that's their target focus, but they do it in such a way like, okay. Um, Love OpenSUSE. They claim to do that also, but you have to, the, the barrier of entry is a little bit higher in OpenSUSE because you have to understand a little more of the terminal. And so I, I'm, I'm really pleased by how POP or, or System76 makes it so it's very, everything's very accessible. And on top of it, right out of the gate, it's a dark theme. And it's a beautiful <laughs> yeah. dark theme. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a distribution that, that 
that makes me smile like ear to ear just as soon as it pops up. Ha, ha, pops up. I that. see what you did there. <laughs> oh, oh. Something I, I really like about the pop shop is that um, they will also package some things that aren't necessarily like a, in Flat Hub or in the Ubuntu repos. Um, I forget what example i had offhand but i know i saw a couple of things oh like um alacrity or I, I think it's called um i don't know if it's in the ubuntu repos now but for a long while it wasn't and that's the uh the gpu accelerated terminal application they had actually had that packaged up and available in pop shop which i thought was super cool um hmm. and there's a lot of little things like that that typically like i would have ended up going and installing from <laughs> from a random dev file somewhere that they were just like, yeah, we'll just put this here. <laughs> so I like that. And they use uh, um, Eddie instead of like uh, GW or that. That yeah. works real well for uh, packages. So if you download those. Awesome. Yeah. I highly recommend if um, in terms of like installing software, especially things like if any of you do like, uh, like NVIDIA stuff or 3D rendering stuff, um, I think the docs for Pop OS are really, really good. Um, if I was to have um, any criticism of the Pop Shop after using Pop OS for such a long time, they se um, it seems to take a long time to populate the updates, even though it will tell you there's a couple, of, there's a bubble there that says two updates, then you click on um, to go to those updates, then it'll start searching again. And it seems to take a while with search. And I've noticed that in the pop shop over a long period of time. So I don't know if they're working on maybe getting something a bit quicker in that or, or that's just the way it works. I don't know. Maybe I'm impatient. I don't know. <laughs> you probably are. Oh. <laughs> it doesn't seem to take that long. I mean, that I really, really notice. It's nice that when you click on the bubble, it takes you right to it. Um, and this is the simplicity of it. So uh, one day I mentioned my son, who, you know, a uh, Linux, not an Linux enthusiast, but he'll sit here with his laptop on Windows 11, and then he's got stuff going on here, and then he's got the dual screen pop going and that, and he'll do all the, uh, yeah, actually, he, he, moved, he did the update to 2110 from 2004 without even telling me. You know, and the, not that it was a, it's a smooth process when you do it, it can mess up, but um, he, he and he updates the system all the time. Uh, I don't have to worry about it like with grandpa. I have to have to worry about it getting updated. So I have a, about the pop shop since I uh, I wanted to say that all the icons for the applications were were, you know, all populated where last week I criticized uh, uh, you know, Solus and their package manager because they didn't have any icons. But you know, it's it's that brand recognition. It's being able to see the icon for you know FileZilla and, and and GIMP and those types of things. And where you say, oh yeah, that's an application I've used before. I want to install it. So that I found the uh, Pop Shop had all of those things. So. Anything else on the applications? So I I, am, I want to say also that I'm very pleased to see that Flatpak is already enabled by default. That opens up a whole world of applications. Pretty much anything you need is going to be available to you. Pretty much, not everything, obviously. But I do I do appreciate that. I, I the more I I test out distributions, the more I I find I'm 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 really enjoying the Flatpak experience. Although theming sometimes isn't always the greatest, uh, but like the theming integration. But I do sincerely appreciate the ease of getting applications into your system and it really opens up a, a world of flexibility for the user as i see it so it's a it's a wonderful thing it's a great for the user and um you know diminishes the need for the aur okay um anybody else have anything on that if not i'd like to talk about the tiling uh feature okay i see a lot of north and south so Shickle, go mm -hmm. ahead and, and, and start, a, start the conversation off on the tiling. Oh, boy. Have you ever just wanted to have windows next to your windows? Because <laughs> <laughs> so it still blows me away every time I use this because I, I don't daily drive Pop OS, but every time I try it. Um, yeah, 
it uh, it has an auto tiling feature. How many of you use tiling window managers? We got one, two, three. Okay, four, a decent amount. Cool. Uh, so though I can speak, I know how to talk. <laughs> um, so uh, Pop Shell has a really cool feature which will automatically tile windows next to each other on your desktop. Um, so it's kind of mixing the worlds between desktop environment and window manager, tiling window manager together. And there's a lot of keyboard shortcuts that move things around. Um, did did everybody try it? Who tried it in in this selection? I've okay. been using it on and off. off. Okay. How does it work for you? Like, do you do you like the tiling? Can I jump in? Ab do it, please. <laughs> Just real quick. Um, so I've since since I installed. Pop OS, um, I've pretty much been using the tiling feature ex exclusively um, just because I'm used to tiling um, window managers. And it, you're right, it, it, it's amazing that they have that option and they, they developed that option um, pretty much from scratch, I believe. Uh, there are a, a couple of things that I notice. It's it's not quite as fluid as I would, I would normally like to see in a tiling window manager but it works and it also allows, and this is a big advantage, it allows you to use your mouse to move things around, which is something that a lot of tiling window managers don't. Uh, the, I did notice though, that when moving things around with the keyboard, sometimes it didn't quite work as I expected. So if I moved a window, say if I have two windows side by side and I wanted to swap them around, it would move one window and then overlap the one that was already there and it wouldn't automatically uh, sort of rearrange them. So that was one thing that I found didn't quite work as I expected. I'm not quite sure what was with that. But then if I use the mouse and drag the windows around, that worked really well. I, I just really like not having to think about where to put my, my windows when, I, when they open. Uh, I think that that's just me maybe being lazy. Uh, and with that, I think it's also important to remember that um, tiling pretty much also um, requires you to use workspaces. Otherwise, I don't think you're going to have a good time. Uh, but that's been my experience. I'm happy to hear what other people have to say about it. So I also, use, when I use Pop OS, I use it uh, only with tiling. And I experienced uh, the same uh, experience that Vince had, but still, it's, it's great. works. Uh, their launcher is great. The tiling is just, I mean, for, for floating window man, I mean, for being on GNOME, and the way it works, I think it works very, very good and very fluent. So, anybody else on the tiling? We saw a lot of lot of excitement on the tiling. Yeah, I uh, I tiled a lot, so I use Awesome Window Manager on my other desk laptop over here, and so I'm used to the tiling window managers too. But yeah, it's so cool. It's I think it's about it's about the only distro I know that builds it in like that. I mean, you can get on KDE, you can get a tiling window thing going, but it's not as good, not as smooth and all that kind of stuff. Overlaps windows sometimes, things like that. But yeah, I really like the, the uh, tiling window manager aspect of it. It's one of the cool things that have caused me to install it and use for a daily driver for a while. Is Jeremy uh, Stoller? He's a- uh, Solar. Solar, Solar. He's a, he's a developer for Pop, is he not? Yes, he is. Well, welcome. Welcome. Glad to have you in the chat. I um, don't worry. We're not going to be poo pooing on Pop OS. It's too good for that. And not at all. It's, and it's also against the rules. <laughs> <laughs> so I did try the tiling window manager feature in a, the last version of Pop OS. I feel like it needs to be a little bit more obvious or easier on how to enable the feature. Um, I do like it. It's just I had to dig to figure out how to enable it. Uh, but once I did enable it, it's not actually hard to do. It's literally a keyboard shortcut. It's just figuring out how to do it that got me. Did anyone here try stacking? So Oh, yeah, um, when you put one window over another and you got the tabs? Yeah, and it, it turns them into, like, tabs. I, oh, that's what you mean. I really liked that. <laughs> um, I didn't know it was a thing, and then... Um, uh, one of the the group members, Tyler, actually like showed it to me, and it has totally changed like my editing workflow. Now I have like Audacity and Caden Live stacked on each other, because hmm. um, I don't feel like I need to switch like a whole workspace to go between them. I need to just flip quickly to Audacity, 
change whatever audio thing it is, <laughs> export it real quick, and then go right back to Caden Live. So that was super handy for me. I think that's a cool feature. And I also really, really like the the outlines that you could put on the windows. Like you could change the color, I think, but um, it helps make it obvious which window is focused. Um, I Without that, I would honestly have no idea what I'm doing. So I thought that was a really nice touch. Yeah, speaking, really, of, yeah. speaking of the outline, the only problem is if you change your uh, your theme to rounded corners, then the outline does not respect the rounded corners. Oh, interesting. Oh, I think I know why too. Because I think the theme the theme is just the visible part, but like the actual window itself is still there. That's probably what it is. That's interesting. Um, I found that with uh, with streaming, because uh, I was trying to set up uh, the tally manager to keep everything kind of in one spot and all that. But as far as window capture, so Zoom, I had a, and what which is nice. I don't know if you can do this on other uh, tally managers. You have a floating window on top, so like Zoom uh, window, I was able to let it float on top. Otherwise, the capture in OBS is not right. I don't know if everybody, I know not everybody here is a streamer, but if you've ever noticed that, you know, Alan, yes. I think that's kind of handy because um, I, they actually have like, a, I think a default list of windows that are floating and not tiled. Mm -hmm. So uh, for a lot of people that use Steam, you probably know when you first started up, there's that like little window that pops up and it's like updating Steam, doing this, this and that. It would be like super annoying if you opened that and it reshuffled all of your windows just for that little update prompt. Um, so it's kind of cool that they were like kind enough to not like when I saw that they added that to the list, I was like, cool. yeah, it, it, and then you can add any window you, you need to that list too. Yeah. As an Actually, aside, as an aside, um, Shiko, you mentioned Tyler. I think you mentioned once in, um, the telegram that, uh, pop shell, which is the tiling feature is actually also available, uh, in other distros. Uh, I think it's in a few. I'm looking at the GitHub now. It says Fedora, Gentoo, OpenSUSE, and Arch. So if any of you out there actually aren't on Pop but still want to try the Pop Shell, go ahead and try and install it. Yeah, I um, I've used it on Fedora a bit, and I can say that it's really well done. Um, like it's, uh, I think Carl George is the person that uh, packages that up for Fedora. But uh, yeah, super huge props to everybody who packages extensions up and apps up for other distros because it's a really cool feature and you know we all have our like preferred distros and really really cool stuff yeah i tried it on fedora the only thing i couldn't get to work on fedora is the launcher because it comes with the pop shell but i haven't tried that i should yeah the launcher did not work for me i actually wanted to uh segue into that and find out it, to me um so i use U launcher normally on any desktop and I'm so used to having a launcher utility. Uh, so the fact that they chose to spend time building one, uh, I think is pretty interesting, especially from a workflow perspective, because to me, that's just a really fast way to get to where you need to be. Um, you know, if it's a window that's not open, then it's gonna launch the application. If it is, it'll switch to the window. There's lots of uh, logic and conveniences built into launcher. Has, did anyone spend any time with that? Or I know if you know people have been using Pop, I know the launcher, some of this stuff is fairly new. I mean, you say, when you say you've been using Pop, Pop for quite a while was just essentially Ubuntu with some of their theming and some, some of the utilities. This Cosmic Desktop is a relatively new thing. And I think the, the launcher is, is part of that as well. So um, I, I really want to spend more time with, with Pop. I've enjoyed I installed it today, did a little extreme distro hopping, and I'm paying for it right now because <laughs> my, uh, my, my external USB audio device for, for my microphone, for whatever reason, isn't working. It's happened on another install as well, another distro, and I, I'm, I'm thinking maybe it's a kernel thing. This is using 5.16. I want to maybe try to get up to 5.17 or maybe even drop back to 5.13 and just see if that's what's going on. Um, anyway. One of the things definitely for me, besides the tiling, which I'm definitely interested in trying, is the launcher, uh, having it built in. Has anyone really focused on that? Did they use it, like it? Any commentary on it? 
I know I have, I mean, I don't use it. I prefer like two applications. The one thing I have a problem with, with the launcher, like if I want a certain application, I start typing it, it's like the fifth one down. And then you got to hit number five or arrow down to it. Whereas if I'm using all applications, right, you know, I just hit the, where I got to set up the window key brings up all applications. And I could just like, I have a YouTube, uh, uh, a window, you know, from uh, PWA from, you know, Chrome, I hit Y and YouTube's the first thing that pops up and I hit enter, I'm there. And uh, that's what I like about that. So I'm, I'm not really so, sure so why saying, I would want to use something like you launcher and a launcher. So you're saying I, that then it doesn't, so you launcher and other launchers, the good ones at least will remember frequency of, of an application being opened. And so if you open YouTube or something by name often, then the first few keystrokes should be looking at recent apps first. You know, they should be weighted higher than the rest of the apps on the system. So are you saying that pop, it doesn't look like it does ever? Maybe I don't out? use it enough to do it, but uh, you know, it's like when I would, it's like, okay, it's like the second one down, the third one down. And I know it's probably great for if you're looking for specific files, because then you can find it that way. Uh, you know, but that's not how I kind of, I, I usually go for the application and I just, I just reset my super key to be the uh, all, all uh, applications to find it that way. Yeah. What I noticed the launcher actually displays the open windows that you have and you can switch between them with control one, two, three, four, and whatever windows you have. So it gives you a keyboard shortcut next to the name of the window that is open. I, I love that. I was using that a lot. I know it's, it's great. Okay. Well, maybe we can segue into a little bit of what, you know, what we found <laughs> difficult. What areas did you find difficult, if any, with pop? Um, one of the things that I found was the wallpaper didn't change. Uh, I would click on it and it wouldn't do anything. It would change in the other setting. What was it called? Uh, the workspaces. It would change there, but it wouldn't change on the desktop. If I logged in and logged back out, it would change. Hmm. So, I never, yeah, I've never seen that, ever had that problem on all three I went Desktops. online. I went online and I asked around, and they, somebody said that that does happen every once in a while. <laughs> Were you using a virtual machine with that? Yeah, a virtual box. I tried um, doing it right now with my own install, and I, I can't change the wallpaper either. It will change in the workspaces though, but it will not change in the desktop. You might want to try adjusting your video driver to something else. Sometimes Pop OS has a big issue with that. I'm, I'm using the uh, NVIDIA. Um, not the proprietary drivers, the other ones. The I forget what it's called. Okay. Nouveau. Nouveau, that one. I I actually was talking about going into this um the settings of VirtualBox and changing your video code in, in there to something else. Yeah, you got VBox SVGA and the VM SVGA and all that. If you try changing those, it might give a different result. Mine's actually mine's actually on hardware though. Oh yours on hardware, okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. If I could so just what, uh, go back, sorry. If I could just go back to the launch, I just missed. I was trying to get myself okay. in between there. Um, if you type question mark in the launcher, it gives you um, quite a number of options, which are quite cool. So if you want to try that, I'll check it out. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dale. We haven't heard from you at all. I don't know if you uh, had something you wanted to share. I want to make sure you get an, get an opportunity to say say a thing or three or four. Or, or whatever you feel comfortable with. All right. Well, I'm on uh, mobile data, so if my video or audio gets garbled, just let me know. No worries. Um, I don't know. I know what you've discussed in the past, what, 20 months since I've been on, but uh, so I don't want to rehash a lot of stuff. But I've been using Pop! OS. Let's see. I bought my uh, System76 Penguin last March, so it's been about 11 months. And a month after, I uh, replaced uh, Mint Cinnamon out of no fault of it. I uh, liked uh, Pop! OS was having some NVIDIA, uh, weird video issues on, uh, on uh, Mint. And I installed the, uh, the ISO on my desktop and I have to say, for a computer that's using NVIDIA, it was just like that. My Good. monitor is not a standard resolution. It's, oh, I'm trying to remember what it is. I think it's 5120 by 1440. 
at 120 hertz is what it's native. And I always have trouble hopping because the Nouveau never wants to go above 3840 and et cetera, et cetera. And I was impressed. I mean, booted up the installer, went through the installer, it rebooted, created my user account, logged in. I was at the native resolution, just like that. Didn't have to change a thing. Didn't have hmm. to change my refresh or anything. So I was pretty happy with that. And you had mentioned the, uh, the uh, U launcher, the, their, their, their version of the U launcher that uh, Donnie had already mentioned. The one thing I like is when I press the super key, if I don't type in a search, it will give you all of your running applications and the control number to switch to them, which I think is a nice, uh, nice feature. It's a little bit different of a workflow than doing the uh, regular alt tab and cycling, you know, cycling through them. But uh, I, uh, I really, really like it. It's uh, works well on obviously on the system 76 laptop it it works well but, but uh, I'll let you uh, get on with your itinerary here oh no worries well I um that's actually one great feature about um pop os is that they have it set up directly to work well with the nvidia drivers so uh, that's what I really like about that. It really worked well when I had my gaming laptop last year. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, Dale, you, you must be on the same uh, monitor plan as Schickel because I guess he has like an ultra, ultra, ultra wide because he says 5,000 something pixels wide. That, that is super ultra wide uh -huh. quad yeah. HD, which is amazing. <laughs> that yeah. is so yeah. cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, so yeah, that's why I told you sometimes on these mobile data connections, I'd lag behind everybody else. I'm sorry, because I do a, I do a Zoom call with some friends whenever I can because my work schedule driving on Sunday. And it sometimes I just have to disconnect or turn off my video because it gets so laggy. So I apologize. No but my issue was I had used dual monitors for like 10 years all the way from when we had CRTs. I think I had like dual 17s, dual 19 CRTs. Then I got the 22 inch flat screens, the 24 inch flat screens, the 27 inch flat screens. And I sit and I had a bezel right here. And it was like, finally a friend of mine, he's a huge gamer. I think he's got like 400, 500 hours in the witcher and pretty much any other game i mean i don't know how he does it when he works 12 hours a day but anyway probably less sleep yeah probably he said dude you got to check out this monitor the aoc has got this monitor i can't it was you know really good price and he said it's 51 or whatever and he said it's the exact same as your 227s but in one monitor and i'm like yep and that's the only reason why I got it. And the only problem was getting it into my car. <laughs> yeah, Micro Center people, they're like, this was like May, June. And they're like out in the parking lot. And we're like, well, got to take this part of the box off. Got to take this part of the box off. Okay, we're going to take it out of the box. Okay, well, we got to put it this, this way. This, Yeah. It was pretty much 40 miles of not seeing my rear view mirror, which they said, are you okay with that? I go, I'm a truck driver. I don't have a rear view mirror. I got a mirror there. I got a mirror there. I got a mirror there. I got a mirror there and a mirror below that. I'm good. Only problem is trying to get it out of my car again without scratching the, uh, the screen. So yeah, it's, I guess they call that the first world problems, but really that's really the only reason why I got it is because of having bezels for 10 years. <laughs> My friend's mm -hmm. like, well, do triple monitor. And I'm like, yep. I don't have room for triple monitors. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's pretty much my tale of woe. Uh, yeah, but, 
Yeah, I have, my brother has one of those ginormous screens. I looked at it and I was like, nah, I'll, I'll stick with my my quad setup. I like having individual monitors. It's because with his, like I was watching him, you know, move screens around you know, or windows inside of it. You can only do so much with, uh, you know, you can you know, have to half the stuff, half his games don't even go full screen because of the, uh, of the way how big the screen is and all that stuff. So it's, I was like, no, I'll stick with my, you know, at one point in time I had six monitors right in front of me and I brought it down to four because it's a, uh, you know, I got a new desk and whatnot, but yeah, I'm not not into the whole ginormous curved screens. Yeah, personally. the like VLC, you have to go in, and I don't have that configuration. I can't share it because I don't have it on my laptop here. But there is a way you can go in and set a default full screen resolution for VLC, so that when you do hit the full screen, it'll come up in that size. A friend of mine told me about that because he games on his. 32 and then he'll have a 24 next to him or i think i gave him but no i gave him that's what it was when i got my my uh my monitor i gave him one of my 27s so he actually has that and sometimes he'll use his 55 inch tv but anyways he's the one that told me about this because he found that out because when he was doing something on his television you can just imagine a 55 inch television full screen you know is is, is huge so that's one of the problems with the ultra wide is the uh, is doing something like that. But one thing I I know that Chickle has talked about, and I'm not sure if it was on here or if it was on any of the other podcasts that, that he's he's on, is a workflow of not having the system tray and a default GNOME installation where you don't have the notifier. And the thing is, when you've got 5120 by 1440, you can have nice size windows open on your entire monitor and not need notifications because they're all in front of your face. So that's how I pretty much work with my computer. Because that was a challenge I had with my friend Josh Hawk, who's on the Midcast podcast. And he's like, I bet you you don't even need, need that. And I'm like, so he had, he challenged me. He's like, I bet you, you can go a week without needing the, without using the uh, thing on pop. And I'm like, okay. So I made all of my windows, you know, across there. And I'll tell you what, I can see how the GNOME workflow works like that, where you don't need notifications. Okay, well, it's, um, since we're talking about kind of about monitors, I think uh, Eric wanted to bring up about uh, the hybrid graphics drivers that are set up out of the box with Pop and how it looks on those monitors. Right, yeah, I just was gonna say, you know, I've, I've brought it this up before, the difference between, you know, what, what a distribution brings to the table versus a desktop environment and how, you know, some distros will, add themes and do lift different little things. Um, one of the things that always surprises me is that distros don't seem to put much stock into the experience that laptop users have, which I'd have to think that by now, the wide majority of people are using laptops over desktops. I mean, sure, yes, there are certainly gaming desktops and stuff like that, but for the most part, I'm, I'm anyway. Uh, this is one of the few distributions where, you know, if I downloaded the, NVIDIA version of the ISO. And whenever I install, I go to the power, meeting, uh, power menu. I can pick between four different graphics modes. And I can also pick the, uh, the CPU mode as well, whether it's balanced battery life or high performance. And the fact that that stuff is just built in and enabled by default. Um, now of course, System76 being a hardware manufacturer, they would focus on that type of experience. But it is truly one of the few distros I've ever had that just worked perfectly as is with, with no extra effort on my part. Uh, back when I had my gaming laptop at uh, um, about a year ago before it fired a lightning storm, which kind of sucked, but uh, that always was uh, a big issue was the NVIDIA drivers until I installed Pop OS. And I used that until it blew, and I never ever had an issue with it. On the um, power management side of things, I've 
I think I've heard you, Steve, talk about um, how Pop! OS has, uh, um, seems to improve your power management. I'm, it might have been just me subjectively noticing this, but I think it does improve my laptop battery life. And me being you know, mostly a laptop user, I'm not quite sure if they've, um, and I don't have any metrics to prove this. I haven't actually gone and measured it so objectively. But um, I think that um, it seems to manage my laptop battery better than um, when I use Arch on it. Yeah, I know on, uh, like I have mentioned, like during the streams and that, that when I have all OBS and Zoom and all that open and that, when I was on, you're doing it on Peppermint and, you know, with light with uh, RAM and all that, but it didn't do nothing for power management. I tried TLP, but then it turns out, you know, you have to go in and do a bunch of other settings. And then I noticed a big difference once I started doing more on pop of how things didn't rev up so much. And that's nice. But I think, uh, Jeremy, if you're still out in uh, the chat, um, they uh, just, I think, released, uh, they did an update. And if anybody updated um, and you had to restart, it's the first time I've seen it, uh, you have to restart your system after this update. And I think they did a new power management thing. I have noticed on my desktop, it takes a minute and eight seconds plus to get to boot. Um, I ran system D uh, analyze blame and it turns out you power is taking well, actually it's more than it's more than a minute more than a minute and a half for my desktop to boot and uh, I did know um, and you uh, power is taking up like a, a minute eight uh, in that boot process. So uh, I am on my laptop I don't have that. But on my desktop, I do, and I don't know if that's because of what with the NVIDIA drivers or whatever, you know, or with NVIDIA and that. It takes my my son thought there was something wrong. He was, I think something's wrong with the desktop, Dad. But it took a long time to come to the long odd screen, and I've never seen that happen since I've been on Pop. Um, there could be two different uh, problems with that. Um, it could be just your standard NVIDIA code. And if that's this, if that is indeed the problem, just go into system D and just disable U power. Okay. So I I had uh, found using remote desktop uh, XRDP, um, I wasn't able to change the resolution within Pop. But when you use a remote desktop client, you can set the re resolution a little bit higher. Um, you know, in the in the remote client, and Pop OS does uh, uh, you know support that. On my uh, on the desktop, I still had issues where I couldn't change resolutions, and it is a it's an older uh, Nvidia GeForce. But um, yeah, I had I had resolution switching um, challenges, but it just works. It, it it's okay. I didn't try it on my main machine that I use, my main laptop, I should say. I, I kind of, kind of wish I would have, but I don't, I don't want to mess something up because I'm good at messing things up. But I'm interested in seeing how it compares the the pop defaults compared to the um, OpenSUSE defaults because I, I have a an HP Elite book and I get about eight-ish hours out of it doing just like as long as I'm not doing like a lot of multimedia stuff, but just like regular like office type work or or whatever, but I'm I'm wondering like how how it would compare uh, to to Pop OS. It seems like you know what I read online is that Pop does a really good job of power management on laptops. Um, so I, I don't know, I'm I'm curious to see how it would compare. That would be a fun comparison, like to to put all the laptops side like put a laptop and then compare the different distributions side by side. I'm sure different laptops would perform differently with different distributions. Like as far as like a newer one might do better with you know. X, Y, or Z distribution, but it's, I think it be an interesting study. The desktop environment plays a role because uh, the uh, more of GNOME is a little more resource heavy. It may hold, um, may have to, it might drain a little bit, a little more, just to, just to yeah, that's wonder about that. I, I, I do feel like Pop has done something to make it feel lighter though. Like it doesn't feel like GNOME in the, in the sense that GNOME, I don't know, just feels a little bit heavier. But it doesn't feel like Pop Gnome is heavy, if that makes any sense. Although no, I, I agree with you. I mean, it's just, um, I, I, I don't know. It's, it's just so so nice. I just, 
you know, I talk about where when I was in Peppermint and I kept changing and changing my desktop and my panels and all that. And way in the beginning, I, I couldn't get into GNOME and I, my workflow ended up being just like GNOME. So when I moved into Pop or I tried Ubuntu first and then I moved into Pop, it was just like being home. I, 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 and I really haven't changed them. I, I had an extra uh, extension here and there, but not really much. And it's, it just feels nice. So Did anyone get, get um, any visual stutters when you know, you're kind of going through different um, desktop or application switching from like mm -hmm. the overview layout or any of those things? No, no. For the workspaces, no. Uh, Donnie, yeah, I think you want to say something. Yeah, so I installed it on my laptop and my desktop. On my laptop, I had high DPI issues that will not save. So I had to switch my resolution to 1920 by 1080 and save it for it to work. On my desktop, I did have lagging, mouse lagging and switching, but I think that's not a Pop OS issue. That's, I, I think my issue started with that with uh, kernel 514, and I seem to be having that issue on my desktop any with any distro I install. So, but yeah, high DPI was my more was frustrating at first. So I I usually don't try Pop because I'm on uh, BIOS, and Pop Pop OS takes over the master boot record, and then I have to cancel with that. So usually I don't try it because of that. I wish the installer would have an option for you to to not set up Grub or not install Grub possibly, maybe install it to the, to, to the same partition. Um, as far as um, the tiling, I tried tiling uh, Zoom, uh, Firefox, uh, the Zoom window and um, Telegram with the automatic tiling and it wouldn't work. Uh, I don't know, it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't make them smaller enough maybe. I don't know if there's a limit to the, how small they are. I'm only using 1080p, so I don't know if that's an issue. I'm also have this, the the dock uh, um, showing, so that makes the the window smaller. There uh, are limits to how small windows can be. Yeah. So I don't know if that's an, and that's actually like an issue that I've always had with GNOME, because with GNOME there's no quarter tiling, like I, I every every other DE pretty much, like Mate, XFC, uh, Plasma has quarter tiling. And that's one thing I always miss about, about no, uh, when I miss GNOME, I can do quarter tiling. Um, but I, overall, I feel that Pop! OS really does feel very different from GNOME, even though it is based on GNOME. Everything, everything seems very different in some ways. Like you don't have the same uh, uh, where you pick your applications and uh, launch them. And the tiling, yeah, that, that's very different from everything else. And I, and I think... I think the way they, they've they integrated everything cohesively, it makes it feel very different from GNOME or Ubuntu, even though they're based on, it's based on both. As far as your problem with system D boot, it's not Grub. And system D boot always defaults to taking over the master boot record. That's just the way it works. If, if he's using BIOS, it'll be Grub. A way not to have system D boot. Take I'm, over the I'm, I'm using BIOS, so so I use this, uh, Grub. Okay, then maybe I, I'm kind of out of date on my information, but last I knew, I, th I thought it was System D boot. System D boot only supports UEFI, so therefore they have to use Grub on BIOS. They don't really have a choice. Well, they kind of do have a choice. There are other bootloaders, but you know, out there that are actually either A, usable, B, well known. Uh, and see people actually know how to use your de facto is Grub. Um, and Grub supports BIOS, System D boot does not. So oh, I kind of forgot about that. <laughs> I, yeah, I agree. Um, go ahead. I was going to say, so Jeremy Stoller says we could use Lilo and, and put the, uh, the, the funny face after that with the tongue sticking out. Hmm. Uh, Lilo, that's that's um that takes me back about what 15, 18 years I think. Everyone here, ever, anyone here use Lilo, or Lilo, Linux loader? I think it's what it was. Yeah, that was. You still have fun. a Lilo option with Puppy, I think. They still give okay. you. A little, a little, yeah. Quick aside, I installed and Slack, Slack with Fifteen. Still uses Lilo yep. as well, and it's using Lilo. Oh, okay. I was just gonna say that. 
We should go back to something low. I agree, Jeremy. All right, that's that's uh, let's let's try and make that happen. Again. <laughs> um, all right. So um, I think we've, we've kind of gone over the areas we found difficult or whatever. Uh, what do, any other thoughts about Pop OS that we'd like to maybe say, like that maybe didn't fit in anything else that we've just talked about? We're, near, we're nearing the end of our Pop OS discussion here. I noticed there was. Um, sorry, you go ahead, Cole. Oh, okay. Um, I noticed that um, I, I appreciate. Uh, in the um, in the settings manager, they've got a category called desktop, which gives the user a lot of options in the desktop area. So that that is a really good uh, addition to the settings for the GNOME or Pop desktop. Um, it it just gives you those uh, little little uh, bits and pieces that you can refine the look of your desktop with. So. I find that very handy. I second that. Yeah, it's all of the things that most people find missing from GNOME, right? They've mm -hmm. added back mm -hmm. a tray, they've added back, uh, you know, a launcher. And having those options available, like Ubuntu uses their, uh, their dock, but they've only exposed a few different options, whereas this goes a little further. And uh, yeah, I found the mix to be really good. I was able to move it over to the left, make it hide itself automatically, uh, not be the full width. You know, there's lots of options there to uh, to uh, really, you know, customize it the way you'd like it to be. Probably the only thing that I, I noticed, like with the DAC, I, I normally don't use it, but I started giving it a, a try again, is uh, when you do have it in hidden, um, a lot of times it's not responsive to the, um, the mouse uh arrow being brought down to where it would normally pop up if you were using plank or something like that it's not always responsive as quickly as i would maybe like i was gonna say I, I really like how they give you the option to show or hide the minimize and maximize buttons like they just make it really easy so as much as i love how plasma like you can just literally customize everything like they give you all the little you know levers to pull i like how pop os makes it really simple you want this yes or no this yes or no and just make it very nice very clean it's it's there's no real there's no faffing about you just you get you get what you need and then and then it, it's right there and also just you know little simple things to like where do you want your date positioned you know the set left center right or whatever i think that the little touches like that i think they really focus on on that that simple yet uh, very customizable user experience and i'm going to say again a dark theme by default is is uh, that's <laughs> great that is so beautiful. I find it for a GNOME desktop, it has a great middle ground. It's not overcomplicated and it's not too simple. It's just got the options that people need to uh, just to customize the desktop, including the, the tiling windows, which I, I sort of tried using, but trying to remember key combinations, forget it for me. <laughs> but I can see that it's handy to have there. So have a, a really good middle ground in Pop! OS, I believe. I think we, all, we, we forgot to mention their new menu launcher. So not like the U launcher is, they got away from the GNOME menu launcher with the full screen. And now they're just using like, it's cent centered in the screen, which actually That's, looks very good. It's very yeah, nice. I like it. And it has, uh, when you bring it up, um, it has uh, uh, at the bottom the home office system. You know, it has more folders that you can get to, uh, which I don't think were there in the full screen before. It was not. No, yeah, it's great. The new one. Also, the launcher has uh, the ability to go straight to. Uh, I'm talking about the launcher launcher now, not the application menu, but it has the ability to go straight to different sections of the settings. Which is pretty cool, actually. You can go to most of these settings if you know what the name of it is. Type it in, and it'll take you right there. Yeah, I have to admit um, that um, overview that they have that they've changed from GNOME, where you don't have all the windows zoom out. To me, that was a bit confusing to start with. I must admit, um, just took me a little while to get used to that. Uh, I'm back on GNOME now, just standard GNOME. Um, I still like the overview of the windows, but uh, the Pop! OS one just seems to sort of just have it all compacted a little bit more. So um, I sort of like both now, to be honest. I'm going to say, I, I really appreciate how Pop! OS kind of takes the the messiness of the GNOME settings because they have like 
you have the gnome tweaks, then you have the other gnome settings, then some other gnome settings someplace else. But I like how they they combined it all into a very nice, you know, a, a one a one stop shop, which which I think makes Pop OS stand apart from the um, from the other gnome. But I guess that's going to be a, a cosmic here pretty soon. That's something to look forward to. Oh, I I'm very excited about this. I want to see what they do with all that. Mm-hmm. It's uh, uh, very exciting. Uh, Most interesting definitely. you say. Sorry, Steve. Go on. No, I just said, yeah, it's going to be very interesting. Yeah, talking about the one-stop shop, yeah, they have a, a also a firmware category in, in the settings as well, plus the OS upgrade and recovery, which I've used three times and was pretty much flawless since 20.04 right through to 2110. Um, I had some regressions with Bluetooth um, and some odd starting and shutdown problems, but that's not a Pop! OS issue because I'm having the same thing on Arch with GNOME as well. So I'd have to think it's a something to do with the kernel, I believe. Um, but, yeah, the, the one-stop shop there, they've got quite a few um, things to go through in the settings, and it's great to see everything sort of just put into one spot. I think that's very handy. All right, so let's go into uh, why... If let's say we're, you're stuck on an elevator with a with a, a perfect stranger and they ask you what Linux distribution should I try? Oh no, they ask you why should I try Pop OS? What what are some of those reasons that you would say? And I'll, I'll kick that off with my my example. Uh, so I would say why should you try Pop OS? Uh, Pop OS has a a beautiful dark theme desktop. Everything works very smooth, and they've taken into account uh, various users' needs. Uh, in doing so, because we're all going to have that conversation in an elevator with a stranger about a Linux distribution. So, at least okay, once a week. Weird, <laughs> as weird as that is, as weird as that would be, it's stuck in an elevator, um, having conversations about Linux. <laughs> it's happening. Um, Nate, I would tell them <laughs> that they could succeed where Linux tech steps failed. <laughs> okay. I would. I would actually <laughs> say that. Pop OS actually is a very user-friendly distro, easy to install, mm-hmm. um, and has everything um, available to a new user that's not overly complicated. So you'd probably find it very easy to find your, your way around the um, operating system and also how to um, install your applications w- with a minimum of fuss. Yeah, because as, as an example, like when I set up for my son and my wife, I did it window isk you know with the i put in a dock that was before the you know the cosmic and uh had it set up like that and once my son did the update to 2110 it changed everything around and he was flying in it in no time it, it didn't i mean i'm sure it looked a little bit different from him but he's like oh you know here I, and he he didn't even ask me for help you know so that's how um i believe user friendly it is i would say that it builds on a familiar base for a lot of people and is, is adding uh, new functionality to the otherwise uh, standard desktop experience. And they also are, are approaching it from a hardware manufacturer's perspective. So they're really taking into account what type of machine it's running on and uh, making it much easier. And to your point about being easier to install, choosing, expecting the person to choose ahead of time, whether they're using NVIDIA graphics or uh, that might make it a little more difficult for the, the user to kind of pick up front. But once they've made the right choice, the experience is much more uh, tailored to their hardware. I would say it's so easy, even a caveman can install it. <laughs> is that a reference to Gecko Linux? It might be. <laughs> so <laughs> so Pop OS, they have, they have their own desktop in a way like Linux, Linux Mint, like elementary. Um, they give you the pop shop, so that's different from every other distro. I guess it's similar to elementary, to elementary, but not the same. They also give you flat pack support. They give you um, the NVIDIA graphics uh, out of the box. And like you said, it's very cohesive. Mm-hmm. The, the font's different. It's not like your default font, the wallpapers. Um, everything looks cohesive to the system itself. Could you say possibly that Pop! OS is more of a product and not so much of a distribution? I know I'm probably like uh, some nuance in that, but 
but to me it doesn't feel like just a Linux distribution, a collection of applications, but this feels like a tailored experience as opposed to just, you know, like a sandbox. I'd say that it is a product because it comes with your System76 machines. Mm -hmm. So there is that level that I would say that you'd have to reach to be able to sell it together, I think. So that's, mm -hmm. I think you're spot on there. Yeah, I think it's it's just really good. It's a it's a very good. I'm I'm glad we tried it because uh, I've, ha I've had that itch for a while, and and it just it definitely it definitely was worth the scratch for sure. The juice was worth the squeeze. Maybe another way of saying that. Anybody else have anything they want to say about Pop OS before before we uh, get on to next week's distro exploration? I guess maybe one question: Who's going to keep it? I know Steve will. Are we are we going to do our vote rating thing? Oh, that's right. So we have go around the horn here and and say whether you think it's a top shelf if it's a a craft like a, a specialty drink mix or a well like something like the, a well drink uh, wh where would you place pop top shelf specialty or whatever now mind you uh these are not one is not better than the other because you are in the mood of something for something specific so the, the ranking here is completely useless. It's just to have fun and to tie it into the whole Linux saloon thing. So, Eric, where would you place uh, Pop OS? I think I would uh, I would place it pretty high, honestly. My phone is doing something really weird right now. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would I would place it up pretty high, actually. And I, I have to be honest, uh, I did wait until t t today to start looking at it because my previous mental image of Pop was that it as a more or less a, a, a window dressing, right? It was taking something that existed, making it look a little bit different and adding, you know, a couple of nice things to it, but more or less it was just essentially, you know, a derivative. Now I'm feeling like every successive release becomes more and more their own. And uh, I'm definitely excited to see how they continue on with the Cosmic Desktop and uh, some of the things that I keep reading about, you know, they're, the scheduler they're working on to make the desktop more responsive. They're, they're really looking at the guts and nuts and bolts of, of the distribution itself and making it something unique in their own. So, Eris, what would you say? What, where would you place it? Would you say it's a, a top shelf? I, I, I second what Eric said. When, when Pop, Shops, uh, Pop OS started, it was very similar to GNOME. And it, it almost seemed like there wasn't really a purpose to it. And I don't think there was enough there to justify the like not just using GNOME, but now there's a lot there's a lot of differences. You can really it's a different experience. And yes, I think it is a top shelf. All right, that's two for top shelf. Peter, I'm gonna pass because I do not understand the analogy. It doesn't. It, it, it's a well, okay. So here, it literally, it doesn't matter. So the idea is this is a Linux saloon, and uh, oh, okay, and, okay, and yeah, get so. Out so like we're we're saying we're just kind of giving it like a how you feel about it is it, is this something does it feel I would expensive have it under to the you? counter and bring out in special occasions. Okay. So let, we'll call an under the counter. We'll call it a specialty menu. The the, the hidden there you menu. Go. There you that's go. that's good. All right. Thank you for explaining. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's all. It's just it's a it's a silly nonsensical fun way to kind of give your last opinion on on the distribution. So Jason, how would you rank this? Well, I didn't do the, any of the testing, so I don't have a rank for it. Oh, okay. Kick him out. That's okay. That's it. Hey we'll now, hey have... now. <laughs> you take your cats and get out of here. No, I'm kidding. Um... <laughs> well, that would take a while, you know. I mean, Ten cats, I'm going to have to round those up. It's going to take a yeah. bit. Oh, I'm wait, sure one of those wait. cats can install it. <laughs> the one that's on the desk all the time probably knows. Probably does all the work for him anyway. So it's probably that. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to have the uh, the crazy cat guy Linux uh, distro developed. <laughs> That'll be fun. Well, Colin can help you spin your your own ISO for it, so it'll be great. Thomas, how would you how would you rank Pop? Um, I haven't extensively used Pop OS, but with how much I have used it and how much good how many good things i've heard about it both from you guys and from actually Draugr os users um i'd have to say it's it's a pretty high top shelf like uh like that drink that you can only you know really justify buying when uh you're going to like a, a wedding or something like that is like that high quality um because 
it, it works really, really well. Like people have said before, it's fairly user friendly. Um, there have been issues that I've seen people having on other distributions that Pop! OS just doesn't have for whatever reason. And the people behind Pop! OS um, are phenomenal. They definitely know what they're doing. They write amazing code. If you need support, they will bend over backwards for you. Um, and for a new Linux user who is coming into this, who doesn't have the community, that is essential. Uh, because the first place they go, if they don't have access to the community because they don't know where to go, is going to be Pop! OS support, um, either mm -hmm. by calling System76 or emailing them or something like that. So high top shelf. Top shelf. Okay. Got it. Colin. Just imagine this cup is uh, Pop! OS. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, so look at that. Wow, he, he got like, he like an object lesson here. That was nice. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Mark. Oh, I'm going to go with a Brewer's Prize. <laughs> I like that. So, okay. Uh, you know, because 70, System 76 uh, is, is definitely, you know, making the OS to work with the hardware. I think that's great. Um, yeah. I like the cosmic theme and the, and the, uh, and, and the space, uh, uh, graphics and all that i think that puts it at, at a uh, you know something that is appealing to certain folks and you know ubuntu after so many years is you know you you get the animal that's the code name and that's about it you know there's not not a lot of uh, fanciness there so uh, pop os is trying to do something different it's good so you're saying more of a craft then a specialty yeah. craft. A craft okay all right cool all right rick how would you uh how would you place Pop OS in, in, in your world? Well, I think I'd like it as a craft type thing too. Okay. Because it's kind of a specialty type dream, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's good for new users and especially gamers with the NVIDIA driver automatic and all that kind of stuff. And it's also got a, I'm trying to think. Yeah, it's got all the pieces to it put together well. Excellent. So, well, craft it is. Jinda. Yeah, I'm going to go with everybody else in the craft. Okay. Well, it's not everybody, but it's, it's yeah, a, a, that's a fair so share. Far. Steve. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with Jeremy. It's Pop Shelf. Pop Shelf. All right. I, yeah, yeah, that was very funny when he said that. Yeah. Uh, or no, very, that. very, to me, very, very top shelf. It's, uh, uh, um, it, it, it just seems to work well, and they're doing some really good things, so. It is nice to see. Okay, that's great. I love it. Shickle. Hi. Let's hope this works. <laughs> I think I think top shelf. I think top, top shelf is awesome. Awesome. I love it. Donnie. It's a top shelf for me too. Top shelf. All right. Yeah. Penguin or whatever I call you. Revolution. Penguin Revo. <laughs> Penguin's just fine. Uh, I think that's what you guys always used to call me. But um, my uh experience with pop os even though i didn't do the testing but i use it every day it's a, it's top shelf and mainly because i know with no matter what weird hardware i'm running all i have to do is the graphics codes and i know it's going to work right out of the box without me tinkering with it too too much that's awesome all right that's good reasoning dale well i definitely think it's a uh, top shelf if not just for the uh ease of use with the uh, NVIDIA cards, but for other aspects of it, I'm not a uh, tiling person, but I did turn on this to mess with it and uh, my age, I, I would have to have a cheat sheet pasted to the wall for me to remember all those keyboard combinations. So, but it's good for the people that like using that. And it's sure. very well integrated into the uh, into the desktop, so I was quite impressed. So yeah, it's top shelf. Excellent, thank you, Vince. Uh, to me, Pop OS is like an icy cold cocktail on a really really hot summer's day. I just want to <laughs> grab it and just enjoy it, sip it, and savor it. All right, that sounds like maybe a specialty or top shelf. Does it matter? Doesn't matter. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's a cocktail. Okay. Just enjoy it. That's it. All right. Have fun. I like it. Scratch-a. Uh oh 
I'm just here for the hang. I, okay. I wasn't here last week. I didn't know what you guys were up to, but I'm here. No, no worries. Just here for the beer. I, as long as we don't run out, right? All right. Prophetic. I would say top shelf, um, because to, in, in the field of like a lot of indie based distros, um, Pop is a established company, and it's a great place to. Uh, it's very great place to send people to, knowing that it's not going to disappear, at least not anytime soon. So I would say top shelf. All right, awesome. And I'm actually going to say it's a craft beer. A craft, I'm sorry, craft distribution, because uh, just to hear me out on this one, is I feel like it's specially crafted, like like handcrafted, very with like such. Uh, That's true. Fine tuning. Such, such fine, yeah, fine tuning and detail. And like a a prized, um, uh, a prized brew of of uh, of Linux distribution. I feel like there's so much put into this, so much flavor, so many different things that are just kind of stuffed in there. That that I feel like it is it is a craft. It's very well done. It's a it's such a it's such a beautiful package of of a distribution. And I think it's something other distributions can aspire to for that immediate out of box user experience. That I think that sets it apart from all of the distributions. But that's a personal opinion. Uh, it's, oh, that's my bi- right here, <laughs> yeah. Jeremy says, Pop is a distro of the people, dirt cheap vodka. <laughs> no, it's not we a call that. Oh, we it's call better that. than that, my son. My, better than that. So We call, well, that, think... we call that cup of vodka. We call that rock cut. <laughs> it's called, it'll do. Yeah. It's called moonshine, bud. The gas station wine. Yeah, it's the, uh, the, the, the one that has like a paper label on it. And uh, no. I really do think it's great, and I, I uh, as a as a biased OpenSUSE user, I I get a lot of enjoyment out of using Pop. So, and I'm gonna put a vote in there for uh, for K-pop. Uh, I think that would be really cool if it was on a, <laughs> a plasma base. So I just want since Jeremy's here and he's not he's uh, he's listening, uh, K-pop would be pretty cool. On that, uh, we're gonna go on to the uh, next week next week distribution. Um, so. Normally we have you vote on it, but we do want to keep things kind of uh, lined up with Linux user space. The, uh, there's a lot of the a lot of the crowd that listens to Linux user space does listen and participate with uh, with Linux Saloon, and it's even in the middle days it was, it was very similar. And since Dan and Leo are regulars on here, usually when they can show up, uh, we want to make it so we want to, we want to have uh, for our next week's distribution we're going to do MX Linux because they're going to release this Tuesday. I think it's Tuesday or is it Monday? Eris, correct me. I can't remember what day it comes out. It's already, it's already uh, been released to me because it, I'm a patron. You mean the, the next uh, distro uh, episode? Yes. The next distro will be in two weeks, I think. Yeah, well, they said um, it's uh, February It's not 7th. next week, but the week after that. Okay, so I think, I think it's... I, thought I wrote down February 7th. Am I wrong? They come out with an episode every other week, and they okay. just came out with an episode this week. Mm-hmm. So then should we push back uh, MX Linux till next week then? To if line you wish. Up with their release? What are some thoughts there? Just, um, someone tell me what to do. Peppermint would be good in, t- in yeah. between. Okay. That would be awesome. All right. So hmm. Peppermint peppermint before that. I don't know if we have any Peppermint fans here, though. Oh, yeah, we do. <laughs> <laughs> I was, oh, that was surprised Steve. me. Prophetic. That was a joke. <laughs> no, I, uh, I, after I, my uh, passion and love for Puppy, there was a sweet romance stage with Peppermint for a little bit. Okay. <laughs> All yeah, right, so the then, team I think can use a, a, a nice, you know, because it would be well rounded here. And um, well, I'm gonna, well, we could talk about it in a minute, but um, yeah, that would be great. All right, so one, I have to take better notes, so shame on me. Um, I wrote down the wrong date, and uh, so let's do peppermint then, since I think there's a lot of a lot of uh, plus ones for peppermint. I see, thank you, Vince. So let's let's do peppermint, and then uh, come back next week with a. Um, how we experienced it and if you do have bugs or difficulties you know i would say reach out to steve or somebody else who's involved in the community and make sure we can get some bug reports filed and just kind of help the team out because it's their first release post mark and uh so this is kind of a big deal i, I think it's important to stress that this is like a rebuild of peppermint mm-hmm. because they're not using pretty much anything from the other uh, uh version because they don't they didn't know how to like uh move everything over Right. So, so this is this is this is really like a first release. Uh, right. Peter. Okay. That's a really good point to really check everyone's expectations. Mm-hmm. So that's a really good point to highlight. 
And so it is based on Debian 11. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I'm reading, if I'm remembering what I read correctly. Yes, it's based on, based on stable. Are there any things uh, that we need to look out for, to, you know, prepping for this? Just that don't keep in mind Peppermint 10. Uh, it's totally different. Yeah. Uh, and there are some changes, um, some mildly surprising changes. Um, it's a bit different. Are you saying Peppermint 10 is the new or? or no, Peppermint, it's, it's actually, it's if you go to the OS. site, it's just Peppermint OS. Okay. So when you go to the download page, it's actually the very first one that everybody misses because we're now not doing numbers. We're talk, kind of calling it Peppermint 11 now, but it, it will just be Peppermint because things will be rolling. And um, I guess since we're not a subject and then I'll pass it on at the end, that tomorrow I'm doing on my stream a thing, a whole thing on Peppermint. Oh, so, uh, right. and uh, I got some history and some insight because excellent. someone's kind of a part thing. So, I, so, I, so I, I, just, I think just so I understand, Peppermint is now changing its release cycle from, I believe it was Ubuntu to a Debian stable and they're rolling instead of doing stable releases is now. It's, well, we'll talk about that. I, right, I think so, the reason why they, why they have both versions of, of Peppermint it's because they know that it's it's like like uh, Steve said you're supposed to like kind of forget about ten. It's not gonna be like it's not eleven uh, ten plus something. It's like totally different. So they do give you those both options just in case you still want to try the old version. Mm -hmm. So so it's kind of like the or like a reboot of um of Star Trek. Yeah, uh, you may not like how it tastes. Actually, that's a bad example because I don't like the reboot of Star Trek. All right, so there's some things to keep in mind that instead of using LXDE, they're using XFCE, the desktop environment. They also replaced the Ubiquity installer with Calamari's. They decided to use Nemo instead of Thunar as well. So that's just some, some things I've... I've well, they, Nemo's been their file manager since six. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I, don't, I didn't recall what it was before. So they're not providing web browser by default. Instead, you choose which browser you want to install on the welcome tool. That's an interesting change as well. well very cool. All right, so Peppermint is... So for next week... I think, uh, yep, got the thank you, Vince, for putting it in the chat. Much appreciated. And uh, we look forward to that and, uh, and how, your, how your unique exploration goes. And also, I want to thank you, uh, Jeremy, for being in the chat. And uh, uh, trolling is not the right word, but um, <laughs> poking a little bit at us. And I think that's fun. And so thank you very much for being. And uh, you did, we really appreciate everything you did on, on Pop OS. All right, so uh, for move on. Um, doing uh, some real quick housekeeping. So I got the a bunch of logos in. I want to thank everyone for sending in logos. Uh, I haven't sorted through them all. Uh, this week kind of got away from me. Um, so I will be releasing on the Destination Linux Network Discourse Forum uh, a method for you to vote. I'm going to narrow it down to a few and a method for you to vote uh, on on the on the, the logo. So we're going to go with like a, kind of a, what the community likes the most. And hopefully we'll have a um, uh, well we'll have the logo from there. So uh, if you want to try and submit a last minute uh, logo, that's cool. I'll still put it in there, but I will be looking at them within the next couple days. So uh, like Monday, I don't plan on doing much tomorrow. So Monday I'll be looking at those. So uh, I guess unofficially I extended it. You know I'm okay with sending it within. I'm okay with late homework. Not a big deal. Uh, I'm. I, this week sort of got away from me, like most weeks do, but I will be working on that this week. So uh, if you have any, then, you can, then we can vote on it on the form. All right, so what I'd like to do is uh, uh, muddle through the, the Linux news. As always, big, big, thank, big thank you to Michael for This Week in Linux for help mixing up a great flight of topics. And I'll first start with LibreOffice 7.3 was released. Now, who here uses uh, local office applications? Is that, is, that a, is that a big thing for... For anybody here, a little bit, Thomas, Mark does. I, oh, of course, man. I'd expect Rick to. Okay, so when you mean here. local, mean on your system, not cloud based? Yeah, and I think Eris, yeah, he put up his digital hand. I use, yeah. Okay, yeah. So I'm a big fan of LibreOffice. I use it for a lot. Like, there's not a day I don't use LibreOffice. I think it's great. Um, in fact, uh, I decided to start tracking how many eggs that my chickens lay every day. And I have my <laughs> oldest, he, I have a spreadsheet set up so you can put in like how many like green eggs, how many olive eggs, or white, or brown, or duck, or turkey. We only have one turkey, so at the most we get one turkey egg. But anyway, so I'm teaching my son how to use 
spreadsheets now so we can keep track of how many eggs you produce and we've got like some I can't, uh, really high number of eggs at this point uh, for the year so it's pretty pretty amazing actually anyway so there's some new features there are a lot of improvements to make it easier for people to migrate from Microsoft Office to LibreOffice, as well as those who regularly swap documents between the two Office suites. I haven't really had any issues in a while. Has anyone else had any issues with the, uh, the Office suite document movement in a while? For me, if anything's like, like highly formatted, I, I may have issues with that, sometimes like with PowerPoint. But outside of that, I haven't had any issues. Uh, well, lack of um, Visual Basic in Excel is a problem for me. But they have uh, new features to handle uh, changing change to handle change tracking and tables and text within documents. Large files also get performance boosts thanks to upticks in the rendering speed, and a bunch of import and export filters have been added and honed. Now I know if uh, if anyone here does um like data cloud type stuff, so if uh, if you if you were to have a uh, in, in the world of, of like doing uh, like the, a design of experiments, like how something uh, behaves or responds, like, like let's say you're building a refrigerator and you want to track the temperatures and so forth. Uh, you, get, you get like this data cloud. It shows, you know, a lot of, you know, data points, whatever. So something that Microsoft Excel does a really good job of is taking that cloud of data in and then turning it into a really nice report so you can actually see how, how the data, how the, how the, how the appliance is performing. So I appreciate, you know, from a data collection standpoint, if you want to do some data an an analysis with like uh, comma separated values, something like Excel or LibreOffice works really well for that. So Nate, uh, quickly on that, sure. LibreOffice 7.3 calc is not working for some distros. Really? Yeah, so when people went upgraded from 7.2 to 7.3, calc stopped working but only for certain distros and only for certain factors and it's still getting worked out where those factors are i'm still running 7.2 so i guess we'll find out and i just i just did distribution update yesterday so yeah it's now i've got, now i'm just gonna throw this out if people are having issues with that uh, you might want to just swap out LibreOffice from the uh standard uh repos for your distribution just install a snap or a flat pack that might actually fix the issue. Hmm. I wonder what the uh, the issue is with uh, what's causing it to. Um, There's to a fail. lot of people looking at it right now. That's actually one thing I always do whenever I install like a new distro. I always take out the the version that's there, unless it's like a rolling re run release, and then I just install the flat pack or LibreOffice. Yeah, I haven't had issues. I, th I think the only issue I've had with uh, with LibreOffice is uh, there was a. a a period of time where if I change the font size, I would have to click off of LibreOffice and click back on it to be able to actually interact with it again. Don't know what caused that. It's just kind of a weird, a weird thing. So this formatting one too, where it's like, if you go too many bullet points in, it just tabs out like crazy. Hmm. Um, and it's just, and it was, it was, it's, a, it's been a bug for like five plus years. I might just give it a spin now and see if it's still there. But um, that was kind of like my deal breaker because the main use case I had was for outlining things. Okay. Um, and it was just like, after a while, I just kind of like that, 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 that meme of that monkey like shoving the laptop off the desk. <laughs> you know, I was <laughs> like, I can't, if I can't do an outline on, on, on this software, I'm not going to use it anymore. I just kind of bailed on labor office after that. So I've actually had, a bug with LibreOffice for a while now. Um, I have a script that relies on a program inside of LibreOffice. Um, it essentially, I give it like a thing, like a name, and I point it to a text file. It puts the name into the text file whenever where it finds a certain key and then converts the text file to a PDF. It basically allows me to take to generate cover letters like that because I'm lazy and I don't write cover letters when I apply for jobs. <laughs> um, but that program has been consistently throwing errors whenever I try to use it for whatever reason. I guess it just doesn't want to convert uh, plain text files to PDF anymore. I don't know, but- Is, is that a bug or is that something outside the use case of LibreOffice? Um, it's a bug because that, specific program 
specifically has that feature to be able to convert a plain text file to a PDF. And it's it's a part of LibreOffice. I think it actually does use that. Um, oh, so you're using it as a, using a feature in a script. Right. I'm just, so... I'm just using one of its features. Gotcha. Yeah. Hmm. Um, it's just a way here's, to automate it. Here's, here's a uh, suggestion for that. Have you tried just uh, hitting the print button, hitting print to PDF? You see, the problem with that is the idea is I want to be able to generate a lot of cover letters very quickly because if for some reason I lose my job one day, I don't want to have to go and write a brand new cover letter for every single job I apply for. I want to have a generic cover letter. I just give it the name of the company I'm applying for and it just makes it for me. And all I have to do is up space, change name, up space, change name, done. So what you're saying is you're going to be able to generate physical spam as quickly as possible technically yes because i hate cover letters with a burning passion <laughs> but it that's fair it's just something to make my life easier um and doing that in a gui legitimately takes a lot longer especially mm -hmm. because i don't know how this actually operates but when you print to pdf if i'm not mistaken it has to go through cups so it takes longer and if your system's cups server is broken, you can't. Yes, print to PDF. Um, it has to go through cups. Yeah. So then, if cups is broken for whatever reason, which I've had happen to me before, um, you you don't want to do that. It's yeah, much cups more. Cups breaks a lot. <laughs> I mean, for me these days, it's not bad. It's just I've had it break on me before. Um, it's just it's more reliable for me to just directly convert to a TXT file to a PDF file. Um, and since I'm always gonna have LibreOffice installed, even if I barely use it, it's gonna be there, why not use it? All right, so. well, it, it is that time for last call. So I do want to, uh, if, if you wanna say anything to plug, uh, I do I do, wanna, I do wanna plug that um, you know, Destination Linux is streaming live tomorrow afternoon, uh, starting at 1 p.m. Eastern. And then also, Steve, tomorrow, you are streaming at what time? Uh oh, you're muted. So he's not. This is, this is actually like how his streams go. My name's <laughs> Nate. Uh, Central US, uh, 8 oh, a.m. Central US. And I will be doing, uh, a, a, it's going to be all on Peppermint. I have it actually all planned out. <laughs> yeah, I got things going on. It might not do the Zoom tomorrow. And, uh, but I'm going to go over a bit of the history. I'm going to steal some stuff. I'm going to be like Leo, but not as good as Leo. And uh, oh, um, I, I, I might, I have a little insight from some of the developers and I want to share uh, about Peppermint and then we'll go over a live kind of uh, uh, review on installing things. So excellent. I look plan. forward to that. I can usually catch like the first hour or so, unless you're late, then it's like 45 minutes. So usually I can catch the first 45 minutes of your show. Everything's set up so... <laughs> <laughs> that's what worries me all right and then rick you're you're going to be probably testing out peppermint um on wednesday right yeah i tried to install this machine once and i installed in a vm on once i think all right so i'll be installing it on vm in my computer in the framework and see how it goes excellent and then Mark, you got your, I want you to plug your, your Linux user group that you have going on. Yeah, uh, on Sundays uh, at, at three to six Eastern, uh, the Atlanta Linux enthusiast uh, at ale.org, A-L-E dot O-R-G. Um, we have a, a standing meeting every Sunday where we help whoever needs help with Linux. Sometimes it's, we get folks that are just uh, installing Linux for the first time. Uh, sometimes they're running into just some type of crazy problem with a Bluetooth keyboard or something. We, we try to help them out. So you're welcome to join us. Uh, the meetings are online via Jitsi. Uh, you can find us. I, I put it in the chat. It's ale.org. We're also on Meetup. Uh, and thank you. Oh, check that out. Excellent. Thank you very much. Appreciate you, uh, you, know, you hand, handing that out to everybody. Feel to, to join your, uh, your lug.
if anybody else had anything else they wanted to say, like uh, something that's going on this week, I know Colin always, something go always has something going on. He's probably crashing something, I imagine. <laughs> Maybe. I think Dale had some. I think he's got a little bit of a show that he co-hosts. Yeah, so I wanted to make a mention of the uh, podcast I'm on, co-host of. It's uh, distrohoppersdigest.blogspot.com is the website. And uh, Tony Hughes and Moss Bliss of, uh, of the Mintcast, uh, they created this a couple years ago and they invited me. I think this will be my first year on the uh, podcast and we review podcast or we review uh, distros. Mm -hmm. um, depending on our schedules and that, we'll do at least one each and uh, tell you what problems we had. It's three weeks or three or four weeks we use it and uh, just give you our uh, issues and I mean, give you some news and just some stuff that we're working on. The uh, podcast is released uh, every month. They pretty much cater it around my, my schedule now. Their previous was pretty much at their own life schedules, but because of my uh, cross-country driving, they pretty much time everything for my my time at home so if you like to learn about distro hopping and how the things play together you can check us out on uh, your favorite podcasting app distro hoppers digest that blog I put the link in the yep. zoom chat for yep. Yep. and I, I put in the youtube chat to uh to pass it on to everybody else too so, yeah it's a, yeah the Thank distro you hopping digest dot blogspot.com and uh, or I think it's, I have it opened up here. Let me make sure I got the address. Yeah. Distrohoppersdigest.blogspot.com. All right. And then also, uh, Prophetic, he gave us a, uh, the FOSTEM is also this weekend. I got the uh, link to that the schedule in the, uh, in the chat as well. So if you want to check that out. So excellent. And if anybody, I think anything else from anybody, if you have anything to plug, say, you know, speak up. Uh, if not, Scrapjaw is going to play us off. I imagine, right? Is he going to? <laughs> so I want to uh, thank you all for joining. Um, uh, you can catch me at Linux Out Loud or formerly uh, Destination uh, uh, ELN Extend. That comes out every Wednesday. And I want to thank you all for being a part of the conversation, both in the YouTube meeting and uh, the Zoom meeting and the YouTube stream, as well as everyone watching the show after the broadcast. I want to thank everyone involved in making Linux and open source tools possible for us to not only have this conversation, but also to have fun, enjoy technology, because Linux truly puts personal back in a personal computer. Thank you for stopping by. Be sure to tip your developers, and please always remember to, resp remember to Linux responsibly. Until next time, see us. Later. Bye. 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 See ya. Bye. Hooroo the kangaroo. Toodaloo and all that good stuff. <laughs> all I have is my microphone.